So we just spent some time talking about noise, what is it, and the types of sources. But now we want to transition to this topic of why can noise be bad? What are some of the adverse impacts of noise that have been um, researched and better understood? And so um, we can perhaps start with um, Arlene, since we were just talking about, uh, you've already mentioned the studies about uh, impacts of noise on children, but also, and maybe also adults. So let's start with um, adverse impacts on humans first. Well, oh. children is not just learning. Actually, studies have found that when they're first developing language, when they're developing cognitive ability in the home, that intrusive sounds can harm them. And that literature has been around for years. The literature is much stronger today on cardiovascular disorders, particularly amongst older people that live near airports. And the studies on that are in the millions. So we're not talking about just doing a laboratory study of 40 people. So the cardiovascular disorder literature is very strong. I wanna make this point that when we talk about the adverse effects of sound on people, we talk about, well, how much will it cost to remedy? I want you to weigh in and think, how much does it cost to treat people with cardiovascular disorders? How much does it cost to remediate children who may have lost a year in learning because of intrusive noises? So the literature today on the effects, cardiovascular, circulatory. I, as a psychologist, would deal with stress. And stress is a result of intrusion of sound. And when stress hits the body, it can indeed, in the long run, damage. Let's not forget hearing. Hearing loss has increased significantly amongst younger people in the last 40 years. So the question is, we have the literature. We know that noise is intrusive and damaging to our health and well-being. And I agree with the earlier speakers in which I say, let's move on. Let's now correct the problem. Instead of more research, and I'm not going to dismiss research, I am a researcher, but there comes a point where you have enough evidence. And if we look back at EPA and some of the statements made in the 70s in the United States, one of the statements was, we may not have linked every cause with every effect, but there's enough literature to make us act now and let's quiet down. Thank you, Arlene. Um, so there was a question that was submitted by the public and I thought I would start by directing this to you, Peggy, which was, well, even if I damage my hearing, can't I just get hearing aids or cochlear implants to fix it? Yeah, thanks. Um, cochlear implants and hearing aids have come a long way. They are they are much improved, and we can we can customize them. Um, individuals can be actively involved in making them sound the way they want them to sound to get the 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 quality, the improved sound quality, and improved fit, and and loss of of some old time problems like squealing and feedback and all. But in the area of understanding sound, understanding speech in the presence of background noise, our signal processing is still really subpar. We are we're still developing that uh, technology to try to improve a person with hearing loss and their ability to understand in background noise. So I would say, yes, we can do uh, very successful work in fitting custom hearing technology for a person, but it's going to still change the quality of life and their um, ability to be active in, in multiple environments and especially in noisy environments. So I would certainly encourage people to preserve hearing rather than just let it happen. Thank you. Um, another uh, person has submitted a question, well, can noise cause other symptoms besides hearing loss? Um, this person says that they've noticed they've gotten headache a lot from being in a loud place. Um, but you know, what do we know about that? Anybody want to try to take that one on? I can. I, Thanks, yeah, Nikita. Can I? 
Yes, so, please. Um, we have we have some research on on this topic to so that you know any you know disease or regarding noise might, may start with headache for instance because it's also related to the uh, situation where where you are very stressed so you will probably react with headache this is this is uh, reasonable and and but also there is something we should consider uh, that we all, as uh, and was said before so we we should look for solutions if a headache is Arising, arising. What can we do against it? So take a rest, go out of the noisy situation, try to find a, a room where you can relax. Otherwise, if it goes on and it goes on with the impact of unwanted sound and also loud sound that not only damage, may not only damage your ear, but also your well-being, feeling your quality of life, then you have to change something. And maybe we could also think a little bit more about what we really can do to change the situation because you can con you can see yes okay i get a headache but what can i do against it not on not only taking a medicament uh, there has to be something changed on, in the habituation over the day uh, dealing with noise yeah. yes thank you so um so we've talked about hearing loss of course um there's headaches. I think we'd also heard about some of the cardiovascular effects that um, has been reported as well. The quality of life. Are there any others that I have may missed add, that anybody would like to? Yes, please. May I add one? Aggression. Uh, as an advisor on to the mayor of the city of New York, I serve on Grow NYC. Uh, any New Yorker can call me with a noise complaint. And when, and when I get a call, the person tends to be very angry, very upset, very disturbed. And I am fortunate being a psychologist, I calm the person down. But the people very often express feelings of aggression towards the noisemaker. And I've had to deal with situations where people have fought because of noise, where the individual goes and bangs at the door of the noisemaker and physically attacks the individual. So I want people to understand that noise can elicit aggression. And this has created situations where neighbors have fought each other and have gotten very angry. And yes, in one case in Cleveland a number of years ago, when someone was complaining about this very noisy neighbor, and I assume the police didn't take it as seriously, but one fourth of July, when that, that, that next door neighbor became especially noisy with his friends, this very nice guy, because he was a family man, and I believe he was a firefighter, took a gun and shot several of those people. So I want you to also know that noise can precipitate aggression. Noise can lead to fights. And yes, people might harm each other over noise. We can't dismiss that's psychological response. Thank you. I've also um, heard about um, studies that are dealing with noise in hospitals. Um, can any of you comment about um, what you might know? Bennett, would you be willing to talk a little bit about those sure. spaces? Sure, well, um, there's a you know very key uh, factor in hospitals and um, of course, uh, speech intelligibility is one of the most important things in a healthcare setting because uh, people need to be able to speak with their doctors. The doctors need to be able to speak and understand with each other and the other staff and the other caregivers. Um, uh, but uh, one of the key things in hospitals now is called patient experience. Everyone uh, who's in the healthcare knows about this. Um, and uh, uh, why is it important? Well, there's a lot of money involved. Um, uh, and if uh, the, the hospitals that score better on the uh, patient exit surveys, and there's several of them uh, that are out there, they get more money from Medicare. Where do they get that money? They take it away from the hospitals that score poorly on those uh, patient exit surveys. And the one of the worst questions that is on the survey is, uh, this is the question out of about 28 questions which deal with your medications and your pain and all these things, uh, is 
was the area around your room quiet at night? And you can answer on a, uh, uh, a semantic differential from always to never, that type of thing. So it's a sociological data. And, um, and they look at those scores and that's the worst scoring um, question. So the question is of course, because of awakenings, people are in the hospital, they need to sleep. They need to uh, heal, <laughs> they need to go home. And the way that they do that is to get rest. So if they're, if they're disturbed in their rest because of some noise, uh, then that creates a poor health situation. It also creates a bad patient experience. So because of the money involved, many of the hospitals now are hiring vice presidents of patient experience so that they can do better. Um, if you look at the sources of noise in a hospital, the awakenings are most often caused by other people. And uh, so it's a matter of awareness, like we're doing today. It's a matter of training. Uh, uh, Health care staff, say the nurses, if, you, if you're being tr uh, treated and, and residing in a room that's across the hall from the nurse's station, uh, the 3 a.m. shift may wake you up. Uh, because the nurses are talking and they're very uh, lively people. I heard one uh, expert in this area use a phrase I loved. Uh, he said, you have to remember that nurses are social people. The last thing you want is an antisocial nurse taking care of you. <laughs> so uh, this is just part of human nature. And uh, so, but it's a matter of awareness and it's a matter of training so that we can train people to uh, keep the noise down in hospitals. Thank you very much. Yes, Brigitta. Can I add something? You know, there is, you surely sure, sure, uh, know there is some, some literature, there's a, there is some literature uh, about healing architecture. So it's not only, of course, it's a social behavior of the patient, but it's, it's, it's obviously also, it can also obviously related to the, complete architecture, how the room is built, what materials were, uh, were elected, and how, how does a room per se sound? Yeah. This is, to me, this is also maybe something we, we could consider in this discussion, having an architecture that con contributes to the healing process. And uh, maybe someone else is also has the opportunity to step in here, maybe Aileen on saying about something about this, because I think this can be a contributor for the healing process and may shorten the uh, presence in the hospital if you get, if you get your the health back earlier. So because of the, the, say, of the situation which will comfort you. In this case, it's mostly you are suffering as a patient yeah, and there are so many things around you that makes you more suffering, and you know we have to find many uh, say uh, as to dis discuss many aspects of how can we um, minimize this suffer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that point. May I add this? I did publish. Yes, Arlene. A, I published a paper on hospital sounds, particularly okay. the ICU and how intrusive and loud those sounds were. But I published the paper with the nurse. And what mm -hmm. we also found out is that the medical staff working in the ICU, being continuously subjected to those intrusive sounds. So we had written this paper years ago, and yes, you have to look at the architectural setting because as was just mentioned, if the nurse's shift changes and that nurse's desk is close to sleeping patients in rooms nearby. That can be intrusive. So architecture, yeah. the doors, the yeah. ICU CU yeah. unit, even when mm -hmm. you look in the neonatal units, you have to really pay attention to the sounds in terms of the impact on the health of the patients, but not, let's not forget the mm -hmm. staff and their intrusiveness. And those are the people I also interviewed. Yeah. May I, may I have add something? You know, yes, um, sounds given back to Mari Schaefer, one of his uh, first researches were in, has been, have been in hospitals. And he took, you know, this nurse, the, he, he was uh, talking to the nurses and to the medical doctors, etc. how they perceive 
the, the room around themselves and what they would like to change concerning their uh, daily tasks and the tasks all over the 24 hours each, each day and night. So I think uh, it, it's, this is very interesting what you said. It, it really brought my thoughts back to Marie Schaefer's beginning when he talked about soundscape. So, so meaning bringing the expertise of the people concerned in the situation you would like that you would like to solve the problems, get, as you did, get the get the expertise, get the expert knowledge from the nurses if you do something about hospitals, and get the expertise from the patient, as you say, the vice president on patients uh, uh, um, suffer, etc. So um, I think this is so important to think about how we can use or can can meet the use the people's knowledge and can meet those people to get the knowledge introduced in processes of changing in these areas. Bennett, did you have anything to add on this, on this topic? I, I appreciate the comments from Brigitte and from Arlene. It's very important to, of course, uh, uh, consider the architectural design and the mechanical design of the building, uh, something that I know you're very close to, Lily, uh, and so uh, this is very important when designing a healthcare facility that the function is maintained. As Brigitte says, we need to talk to the local experts, the people who are actually using the building to provide healthcare, and uh, make sure that their their speech intelligibility is is maintained, privacy is maintained in places where it needs to be, where things need to be private, and uh, but also to help the patient heal. So it's a it's really um, a, a synergistic uh, uh, process, and it's a, almost a living thing—a healthcare facility because you have the you have the the physical facility, but you also have the people who operate in it, and everybody has mm -hmm. to have that goal. So, if the goal is set by the hospital uh, uh, management that we need to have a quiet hospital, then a lot of good things can happen. And that's where we need to start. We need to educate the people who are in charge of these things so that uh, they will take that as a primary goal. Thanks. So yeah, right now we're focusing on this question, um, why it's be bad and some of the adverse impacts of noise and in summary. Oh, we, one of our panelists has come back. Welcome, Bill. Well, hearing loss in the workplace is certainly an issue because if you have noise or communication critical jobs, then hearing loss certainly impairs people's ability to do their job. Um, since I'm here talking with folks at the military uh, today, there was an interesting study some years back where they looked at hearing impairment with people in tank simulators. And they found that when they had they induced a hearing impairment, you know, by putting on some kind of a, a, a um, earplug or some sort, that the tank operators that were impaired were killed in the simulation much quicker than those that weren't impaired. There was a recent study that was published by Dung Brudgart in, I believe it was the International Journal of Audiology. They did a, a war game and it was, you know, a, a paintball uh, exercise. And they looked at this and saw that these soldiers, as they're doing their communication issues, that yes, that, that made a difference. Those that were impaired versus those that had uh, normal hearing certainly did a whole lot better. We see that in industry, in occupational safety and health, uh, in you know manufacturing environments. Rick Neitzel and uh, Linda Cantley, Linda I believe was from uh, Yale and Rick is now at University of Michigan. They've done some studies looking at the injury rates of workers who have been hearing impaired. And there is an increased, uh, I guess, prevalence of hearing, of, of injury among workers that have uh, hearing impairment. I don't remember the the details of how much that hearing impairment was, uh, but yes, those are those are issues that affect uh, people's safety on the job, and that's that's really I think the important thing for us from an occupational perspective. You you just you started saying quality of life. Let me comment on that. In one in one of the two of the studies we did, we found diminished quality of life. If aircraft noise doesn't allow you to sit in your backyard 
doesn't allow you to open your windows, makes it difficult for you to converse in your home or your backyard. You may not yet experience a physiological disorder such as a cardiovascular one, but that is a diminished quality of life. We should be able to enjoy our outdoors. We should be able to open our windows, converse, watch television. Health is a good state of living. A diminished quality of life means that your health is not in a good state. So while we could talk about the adverse effects of noise on a mental and physical ability, let's not leave out quality of life because in the long run, if you can't enjoy yourself in your home, if you can't sleep, if you can't converse, you are not really living. It's a diminished life. And that to me is an adverse effect of noise. Thank you for that comment. Um, I want to bring up one other question that was submitted in the past month, uh, which said, which goes back to the hearing loss a bit. And so I was going to direct this to Peggy, if you don't mind um, answering this one. This person said, I've had ringing in my ears before, but it doesn't last. So does it mean I've had tinnitus and it just went away? What actually causes tinnitus? Oh, that's a big one in a complicated area. Um, and, and some uh, people are fortunate to have, to, I'll say tinnitus, but it's about a 50-50, whether it's tinnitus or tinnitus, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, on the fence, which one we, way we go. Um, uh, we do believe that the, uh, the presence of tinnitus is a sign of some early trauma to the ear. So there could be other things, there are dietary changes, there are other uh, things that can affect our experience of tinnitus. But as far as we can tell, it is most commonly arising as an early sign that something has happened, an adverse effect in the auditory system. And while for some it does go away and hearing returns apparently to normal, we are learning more and more that it may not be really going back to normal, that there, this may be a sign that there are some neural changes in the auditory system, sort of a response in the auditory nerve and the brain that say, what just happened here? And, and um, the gain in the system gets changed. And so we hear things that aren't really present. And for me personally, um, some acute noise exposure have left me with tinnitus most of the time. So that's something that I experience and I'm feeling that in quiet rooms everywhere. And that is a change in, in quality of life. So we would again use the presence of tinnitus as a warning sign that says we need to get those earplugs back in, we need to, to get noise sources controlled at the source to try to turn the levels down. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty good warning sign that we should heed. Great, thank you for that. Um, we're still on the topic of why can noise be bad? What are these adverse impacts of noise? But I'm gonna try to turn us towards talking about animals um, and, um, not only you know affecting um, human life, but also um, the life of other living beings. Um, did anybody want to start us off on this? Peggy, shall we start with you again? <laughs> on this sure. One? It's a it's a new area for me too, and this this also is a new area for me. But um, really fascinating. As some of us have said, we live in a complex environment and world and we're not the only living creatures here and we do think that there are um, behavioral and stress responses that are seen in animals in non-human animals um, so that that um, uh, mating behavior nesting behavior um, migration behaviors can be changed as a result of, of our us generating noise on the planet and I think it's something that we should be aware of completely that uh, some of these things that we like to play with that some of these new toys that we like to have are having an effect on other species as well. So we've been looking at a little bit in the area of wind turbine noise mm -hmm. on animals. We're still um, uncertain as to what uh, some of those effects are. It hasn't been a clear answer yet, but I think it's an area that we can um, 
get enthusiastically involved in to make sure that the other creatures that we share the planet with are are treated with respect and acknowledgement and that we can control some of our noise uh, for those purposes as well. Thanks, Peggy. Bill, are you able to comment as a technical committee of noise chair on some of the other sessions that may have been presented at ASA recently about um, noise impacts on animals? On animals? Um, well, <laughs> when I was first hired to do my research at NIOSH, it was to look at the effects of noise on chinchillas and trying to understand that with the use of an animal such as that, as a model for hearing loss in humans. Um, but there's other work, you know, the, the thing that comes to mind, Peggy sort of hit on it, but we didn't have any, we don't have anyone on the committee here that's a, an expert in the animal bioacoustics. Uh, and that's typically in the marine wildlife realm where we have, you know, cetaceans and, and the like that are being exposed to uh, high levels of noise in the ocean, in some cases, it's very controversial, the, the exposure of whales and such to sonar. And the thing that I found that was interesting in that, it's a, it's a great example that you can, you can do with a two-liter soda bottle. You can take that bottle and kind of whack it with a ruler or a, a rolling pin, and you can see all of this gas that's you know, the, the gas that pressurizes that bottle, you can see that gas come out of the solution and it creates bubbles. And in effect, what can happen in the animal is that you have this uh, impacting it with an impulse of a sound of some sort, and that's causing the oxygen and the nitrogen that's in the bloodstream of the animal to come out of the tissue to become an embolism, and then it comes back into solution as it repressurizes. But that's a, a an immediate health effect on some of these animals that we share the, the planet with. So I wish that there were people like Ann Bowles or, or uh, Marty Hastings on the call that, that could address that more much better than I can. Uh, we've done some work on, um, I'm certainly not a animal bioacoustics, uh, um, expert like Ann Bowles or Marty Hastings, but we've uh, but there are uh, standards out there for this. Uh, we were involved in um, uh, some construction projects that were one of them was in Boston Harbor, actually for the USS Constitution uh, pier was being rebuilt, and because of the Marine Mammal uh, Protection Act, uh, they have to limit the sound le underwater sound levels. Uh, for the harbor seals over there. So uh, we were involved in uh, measuring and also designing uh, noise abatement for the construction activities for the marine mammals. Uh, so that is, that is something that's going on. It's recognized uh, uh, widely uh, for any kind of um, underwater construction uh, all around the United States. And I, and I believe uh, in other countries as well, since this is International Noise Awareness Day. Uh, so marine mammals are getting protection uh, in the uh, harbor and inland construction areas. Uh, and then as far as uh, the effects on um, non-marine uh, animals, uh, say national parks, one of the persons that you, uh, who's done a lot of work on this would be Kurt Fristrup of the uh, mm -hmm. National Park Service, U.S. National Park Service. And they've done a lot of studies on the uh, uh, effects of noise on birds, for example, in the national park or wilderness areas. And there, there can be an effect of the aircraft on their uh, nesting behavior and uh, the reproduction mm -hmm. and all of these kinds of important things. So uh, there is research out there. To follow on with that, Bennett, there will be a session in the Minneapolis meeting in a couple of weeks on noise in recreational areas, and I believe uh, David Braslow and Kirk Fristrup are the ones that are organizing that. Oh, very good. That is our upcoming Acoustical Society of America meeting yeah. in Minneapolis. One, one, Arlene, did you have a comment? Yes. Yes. I live in New York City, and lately I've been getting complaints that the birds are louder. Now, if you're a bird, and you're trying to communicate in New York City, I think you're going to have to become louder. So I haven't done a study on that, 
But I think people have talked about birds getting louder when they live in noisier environments. But let me add another one. I'm a psychologist, and people used to say to me, psychologist, whom do you give therapy to? And I used to facetiously say trees. I give therapy to trees. It's not so facetious anymore because while this is not animals, we're now talking about plant life. Remember, trees often grow and depend upon the dispersing of seeds. And there is literature to indicate that that can't happen in very loud, noisy environments where birds may leave. So that's an area that we should consider too. We may be impeding the development of trees as well as our animal life. Yes, thank you for that, for bringing that um, point forward. Um, so we're an hour into our two hour event and we've discussed what noise is, different sources of noise and why noise can be bad and some of the adverse impacts on life of all types. And now we'd like to move towards um, what, what have we been doing about noise? Um, let's share some of our, uh, some stories about successful actions that have been made to, to lessen impacts of noise. 